This is a Vault Studios production. I'm Reed Redmond. I'm Will Johnson. The show contains graphic material and is meant for mature audiences. This week on True Crime Chronicles. There were several incidents that happened on campus, which he himself actually caused or planned and made himself out to be the hero of those of those cases. This was a crime committed by someone who was supposed to be protecting kids on the campus. He came over to the sorority house trying to console us when all along he knew he had committed this heinous, horrific, aggravated crime. A few months ago, Michael Tater, a reporter for local news station WTOL 11 in Toledo, Ohio, visited a parking lot on the University of Toledo campus, joined by a former UT student named Anna Collin. Anna Collin was a University of Toledo uh, sophomore at the time um, who was just pursuing um, marketing and sales and communications as a student at uh, UT back in the early 90s. What happened at that spot during the early morning hours of January 26th, 1992, has stuck with Colin her entire life. So she was out that night late with her boyfriend. Um, She had gotten a drink uh, at a nearby bar that actually doesn't exist anymore. But um, at the time they were out till around 2 a.m. in the morning. um, And uh, she had to run back to her apartment to get something. And when she met back in the parking lot near uh, her dorm, she was stopped by a police officer on campus, uh, which she found weird because she was the only person in the parking lot at that time, at that late hour. We'll always remember it. I was pulled in. Um, it was the second parking space, you know, directly in front of the tennis courts because when he pulled in, he pulled in directly behind me and blocked me in. And the interaction was just very peculiar and strange. And uh, the officer wouldn't really say why he pulled her over or what the, the reasoning was for questioning her. She remained inside her car and spoke to him through the window because she was perturbed by this and and, and curious why this officer was, was bothering her almost at, at this time of night. Colin was still trying to figure out what she could have done wrong why this officer would be stopping her in the first place, when, to her relief, another car pulled into the parking lot, one she recognized. Her boyfriend arrived who said she he was going to show up um, and they were both going to go get breakfast at uh, a local diner. And by the time her boyfriend got out of the car to go walk over to her car, um, the officer had gotten back into his car and sped off. By the time that he actually parked his car, the police officer had gotten back into his vehicle and taken off very quickly. So the whole encounter, you know, at the time, that night, um, Anna was very kind of freaked out. She didn't understand why it happened, but she also didn't think too much into it. She just thought the officer was being either strange or just annoying. This officer's name was Jeffrey Hodge. And the very next night, Officer Hodge would make another unwarranted traffic stop. Seeing his face pop up in that mugshot of Jeffrey Hodge, it was a, that was probably the moment that scared me the most when I realized how close I had actually come um, to potentially losing my life that night. This episode is brought to you by the Disney Bundle. This winter, there is something for everyone with the Disney Bundle. On Disney Plus, watch unforgettable stories like The Book of Boba Fett and Encanto. On Hulu, watch originals like Pen15 and The Great. And on ESPN Plus, score big with Man in the Arena, Tom Brady, and NHL. Get more of what you love with the Disney Bundle for only $13.99 per month. Includes Hulu ad supported plan. Access content from each service separately. Terms apply. See thedisneybundle.com for details. This episode is brought to you by Bumble. When it comes to dating, your first move can be anything. You just have to make it. With Bumble, it's easy to start the conversation and see what good things come your way. A dance partner, laughter over drinks, maybe the perfect kiss. Ready to find out what happens next? Download Bumble and make the first move at Bumble.com.
In January of 1992, Melissa Herstrom was 19 years old, a nursing student at the University of Toledo. So Melissa was, you know, uh, like like many other students uh, in college, uh, she had a calling to 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 help people. So she was um, going to become a nurse, and you know, from what I have gathered from her, her some of her classmates, from her sister, uh, from descriptions uh, from her parents, uh, you know, during the the court uh, court case back in the 90s is that she was a very genuine and uh, selfless person and you know her her she wanted to become a nurse to help people um, her sister also told me that she always wanted to have kids and she thought she was going to make a great mother because of of how much of a, a polite and selfless person she was um, but you know all that came crashing down it all came crashing down on January 27th, 1992. So Melissa was was out that night and um, she was pulled over in a traffic stop by Officer Jeffrey Hodge, who was an officer with the University of Toledo Police at the time. Um, she did not have her ID on her. So instead of just ticketing her, uh, Officer Hodge, for some reason, volunteered to drive her to her dorm and have her pick up her ID. Melissa got in the vehicle, but Hodge didn't drive her back to her dorm. Uh, he drove her over to the Scott Park campus, uh, which is located probably 10 to 15 minutes away from the main campus. And that's where he, investigators found uh, that he put her on the ground, uh, handcuffed her and shot her 14 times in uh, the back, neck and head. A few hours later, Melissa Herstrom's body would be discovered lying face down in a remote parking lot on campus. The way she was killed was was something out of a movie. It was it was very brutal and and gory. I mean, the pictures and even reporting that we have from the 90s, there's blood smattered all in the snow. It was a very cold night. There was still a fresh layer of snow on the ground. It was it was a very brutal murder. According to the Associated Press, Jeffrey Hodge was arrested four days later, on February 1st, 1992. At the time, investigators told the AP there were marks on Melissa Herstrom's wrists that appeared to be left by handcuffs, and that this clue led them to consider whether someone in law enforcement might have been involved. And DNA testing would eventually reveal Melissa Herstrom's DNA on Jeffrey Hodge's handcuffs. He had handcuffed Melissa that night before he shot her, and... They found her blood on those handcuffs, as well as some of the shell casings had actually hit the the handcuffs and kind of left a mark, as well as as blood from Melissa. So it was really that DNA evidence, which DNA evidence was not as popular or as used as it is today, but it was that key piece of evidence that played a role in leading to his plea deal. But at the time, prosecutors also were weary because DNA evidence was very much in its infancy. I, I actually spoke to um, someone who was in the prosecutor's office at the time, who wasn't involved with the case, um, but was in the prosecutor's office at the time. And he, tell, he told me for the story on background that that is the reason why they pursued a plea deal to get him behind bars because they weren't sure if a jury would be convinced at the time in the in the early to mid 90s uh, of this new you know DNA evidence that this was the the nail in the coffin for for officer Hodge they weren't willing to to make that bet but to this day and looking back on it now in 20 you know that evidence would have held up. You know, in, in, to, in today's day and age, in a, in a courtroom today, that evidence would be damning. But back in the 90s, it just wasn't, it wasn't taken the same way. Hodge ended up taking the plea deal offered by prosecutors, pleading guilty to kidnapping and aggravated murder. In May of 1993, he was sentenced to 30 years to life in prison. But even after pleading guilty to the murder, admitting that he killed Melissa Herstrom, Hodge didn't reveal why he killed her. To this day, he still, uh, you know, his famous words during his sentencing were, I don't have any reason 
for what I did. And he's maintained that throughout. He hasn't spoken with any reporters or any press in the you know 20 plus years he's been behind bars. Um, he refused my request to speak with him for our story. So to this day, no one really knows what his reasoning is or what was going through his mind. But there have been theories raised over the years. One of the most common being that Hodge was after attention. There was a working theory as the investigation and the case uh, continued that uh, he was an attention seeker. And um, he had a little bit of a, back in the 90s, we did a story uh, with a psychologist who believed that he had kind of a uh, inferiority complex um, as it pertains to the line of work that he wanted to get into, which was to be a police officer. And he believed that if he made certain things happen and he made himself out to be the hero of these these things that he was actually causing on campus, that's the working theory to this day, that there were several incidents that happened on campus, which he himself actually caused or planned and made himself out to be the hero of those of those cases. Um, and, and it was in an effort to just grab attention because the job was not as exciting as a University of Toledo college police officer than it would be to be, say, a Toledo police officer or a Cleveland police officer or a Detroit police officer. He was making the job more exciting than it actually was. Following Jeffrey Hodge's arrest, the university's head of security told the Associated Press Hodge may have been involved in a string of fires the previous fall fires the university said were set by someone who had keys to the buildings. In a separate incident, the Toledo Blade reported that bullet shells matching the gun used to kill Melissa Herstrom were found near a dorm building where someone had fired shots at a dorm room. Hodge responded to the shooting and wrote in his report of the incident that he arrived on scene in about 40 seconds. Hodge was also among the officers who first discovered Melissa Herstrom's body. And not only that, but he even showed up at a memorial for Melissa held at her sorority house in the days after she was killed. He came over to the sorority house and actually tried to console some of the sorority sisters, some of the people that were there, when all, all along, you know, he knew that he was a part of this and that he, cre he committed this really heinous and horrific crime. Some of the students at from that time, including um, Anna Collin, uh, you know, they were shocked because they couldn't understand how someone who later on all evidence pointed to as well as a confession that he did this could have been the first person to find the body, could have been present at the uh, her sorority's memorial to her. He was in the room while her body was being shown and it was a memorial. Um, you know, Anna, as well as one of her sorority sisters who um, I connected with for, for my story said, you know, looking back on it, how disgusting and, and disrespectful it was that he was in the room for uh, the memorial that they had at their sorority house just a few days after she was killed, honoring her and he's in the corner acting like he doesn't know anything what happened. He has no idea what happened to her. Um, you know, that really, that really scared and, and, and confused people uh, when they found out exactly that he was the main suspect in this case. It just was so raw and horrific. We, we just couldn't believe it. Heidi Goebelbecker Goodwin was one of Melissa Herstrom's Pi Beta Phi sorority sisters. And she was at the Greek house when Hodge showed up to the memorial service. He came over to the sorority house trying to console us, um, you know, when all along he knew he had committed this heinous, horrific, aggravated crime. Heidi uh, pulled herself out of Toledo after that happened and finished up her semester from home and then never returned to the University of Toledo again for school. She's been back to the campus once or twice, but you know she says it had a long lasting effect, not only on her, but on her children as well. She recently sent one of her older, 
her uh, oldest children off to college. Um, and over the course of their life, she continually spoke to them about what happened when she was in school and the effect it had on her. And, you know, she still is to this day horrified by what happened and it still sticks with her. He took so many things when he made that choice uh, in January uh, and and that has stayed with me my whole life. It was a very scary, dark time for for not only the, the University of Toledo, but the city of Toledo, for Northwest Ohio, for even across across the state. It had ripple effects. The family of Melissa Herstrom later filed a negligence lawsuit against the University of Toledo. Their attorney, Peter Weinberger, told the AP at the time they were pursuing the case to learn more about why Hodge killed their daughter and to explain why the university didn't detect Hodge's shortcomings as a police officer, specifically saying his supervisors should have noticed that he had a, quote, super cop complex. Weinberger recently spoke about the case with Michael Tater at WTOL. This was a crime committed by someone who was supposed to be protecting kids on the campus. The university ultimately agreed to pay the family $1 million, according to an AP article from December of 1997. But the family still didn't get an explanation. And while behind bars, Hodge has remained silent about the case. He, he did wind up confessing, but he never did anything beyond that to help investigators and that's been one of the, and you know, I, I spoke with one of the attorneys who represented the Herstrom case, the Herstrom family in the civil case, and he got to um, depose Officer Hodge in prison. And that was one of the things that surprised him was after the criminal case, he almost refused to take responsibility again for his actions, for what he, for what he had confessed in the criminal case that he did. In the fall of 2021, 29 years after receiving his sentence of 30 years to life, Jeffrey Hodge would become eligible to be considered for parole. As Hodge's parole hearing approached, Melissa Herstrom's family and others who knew her were adamant that he should remain behind bars. They created a, a website, um, the Melissa Herstrom Foundation.com, um, to push for people to either send uh, handwritten letters to the parole board or to write in via email, uh, strongly opposing his uh, potential release um, and and uh, and his parole to be granted, because they made the same points that so many others have made, which is in the twenty plus years that he's been behind bars, he has in no way helped investigators. He has in no way reached out to the Herstrom family to show any type of remorse or apologize for what he did. Uh, and he's and he's never gone on record explaining for himself why he did what he did and the effect that it had not only and most of all on the Herstrom family, but on the community as well. And to this day, he hasn't he hasn't spoken to any of it. He hasn't apologized to the Herstrom family. He hasn't apologized to the department who he disgraced. Uh, it's it's baffling, to be honest. That's also what stands out to attorney Peter Weinberger, who represented the family in the 90s. I certainly remember absolutely no expression of remorse for what had happened. And, and that really struck me that, you know, here was somebody who was doing time, who had pled guilty. He shows no remorse, is uh, an indication that he's unpredictable. And if released... Uh, the the risk uh, of uh, of significant danger to the society um, is is going to be there. Melissa's sorority sister Heidi Goebelbecker Goodwin was also among those fighting to keep Hodge behind bars. The best legacy to Melissa is to continue to fight for justice for her by keeping Jeffrey Hodges in prison for the rest of his life. Lindsay Buckingham, a reporter with WKYC in Cleveland, sat down with some of Melissa's loved ones ahead of the parole hearing. She was so full of life and spirit. Her personality was just contagious. It's too hard to list all the ways Melissa Ann Herstrom's loved ones have missed her. I miss the way she celebrated holidays and how much she loved 
family time and all those things I didn't get to celebrate. But on this chilly morning in Rocky River, her sister, Cindy Herstrom Clark, and good friend, TJ McManaman, sat down to try. Herstrom Clark and McManaman talked about the ways Melissa's death has continued to affect them over the past three decades. It's changed everything, the way we look at life, the way we treat people. It's been very difficult to function at certain times. It's a hole in my parents' heart. It's a hole in my heart. It's all the life that we didn't get to share with her because she was only 19. They also talked about the upcoming hearing, the possibility of Hodge being released. He shot her 14 times at close range and her clothes were partially removed. Like he wanted to see the impact of the bullets and I have to relive all these things, but they never leave my memory anyway. But um, he's, he's dangerous. He passed all the psychological tests that a police officer goes through. And just like he's been quote unquote programmed in Marion Correctional Institution, how programmable is a human that commits such a violent crime? There's no remorse now, there's no remorse then, there never will be. I can't forget what she looked like laying there in the coffin. I can't forget it. I won't forget it. I don't want to forget her memory, but I won't forget what he did. And I will spend the rest of my life making sure he, can, he stays where he needs to stay. The parole hearing took place on September 21st, 2021, when the Ohio Parole Board decided the gravity of Jeffrey Hodges' crime outweighed his attempts at rehabilitation. Our top story tonight, the Ohio Parole Board has officially denied the request from a former University of Toledo police officer and admitted killer. Jeffrey Hodge will remain behind The board ruled unanimously that Hodge will remain in prison for another 10 years, saying, quote, his release into society would create an undue risk to public safety and would neither further the interests of justice nor be consistent with the welfare and security of society. And the family released a statement thanking all those who wrote to the parole board from Melissa, adding, Jeffrey Hodge is locked up tight in prison for another 10 years. We will always be fighting to keep him incarcerated for the remainder of his life. And his next parole hearing is scheduled for September 2031. When you sent that text to me today telling me that um, he was denied parole, there was a, a dramatic sense of relief that I felt. Anna Collin joins Melissa Herstrom's family and so many others impacted by Jeffrey Hodge in a sigh of relief. I think this is absolutely the right decision. Justice has been served. This episode is brought to you by DirecTV Stream. Introducing DirecTV Stream, the best of live TV and on demand, which means you can get all your favorite sports, movies, and shows together so you can watch new episodes of your favorite reality shows live or binge old episodes on demand. Either way, get ready for some drama. And the best part? DirecTV Stream has no annual contract. DirecTV Stream. Get your TV together at directtv.com. Requires high-speed internet and compatible device. Content varies by package and location. Restrictions apply. This episode is brought to you by Cox Home Life. Cox helps make your home smarter. And now you can see what's happening around your home right from your couch. Just pull up your home life cameras on your TV with your contour voice remote and some simple voice commands. Need to keep an eye on the kids when they're outside? Say, show me my backyard camera. And to see who's at the door, just say, show me my front porch camera. To learn more, visit cox.com slash this is home. For True Crime Chronicles, I'm Will Johnson here along with Reed Redman. Reed, a few questions about this case. Prosecutors decided to offer a plea deal instead of going to trial. So is that potentially the reason Hodge ended up with a life sentence with the possibility of parole instead of a steeper sentence? That's actually a bit of a complicated question. Of course, we have no way to know what would have happened had this gone to trial. But by pleading guilty, Hodge did avoid the possibility of receiving a death sentence. But the reason I mentioned it's a bit complicated is that back in the 90s, there was no sentence of life without parole in the state of Ohio. And what Michael Tater told me is that prosecutors he spoke to, as well as the Herstrom family's attorney, said that they did believe that if the case happened today, Hodge could have received a sentence of life without parole. But like I said, there's no way to know that because back in the 90s, that sentence didn't exist. And so, Reed, how old was Hodge when he was arrested for this crime? And how old would he be the next time he's eligible for a parole hearing? He was pretty young at the time. He was 22 years old 
a, a rookie cop on the university police force. So when he was up for parole just this past fall, he was only 52 years old. And the next time around, that that puts him in his early 60s. So, you know, he could certainly make it to that hearing. It's not like he was an old man when he was sentenced to 30 years to life. And Michael Tater, the reporter in this story, mentioned that this case had a pretty profound impact on the University of Toledo and the community. Did he say anything else about that? Yeah, we couldn't fit it all into the episode, but he told me about some of the specific ways that this case changed things for a lot of the students at the University of Toledo and just people who lived in the area. You know, you know, for them, they were realizing that one of the people who was supposed to be looking out for students and making sure they all had a safe college experience was actually out there seeking opportunities to do the opposite. And of course, that's going to change how you feel about being on campus, your sense of safety. And what Michael said is that when he was going back and researching this case, he found some old stories talking about how students would hesitate to engage with cops on campus after this happened and how it sort of left a stain on the university police department and students were encouraged to walk in groups. There were rape whistles being handed out all over campus. There were a whole bunch of different initiatives like that. But yeah, it's it's clear that, like you said, this this had a really profound and lasting impact on the community. All right, Reed. Well, our thanks to Michael Tater at WTOL 11 in Toledo. And thanks to you for bringing us the story this week. And a reminder to all of our listeners, if you haven't checked it out yet, we have a daily podcast. It's called The Daily Crime. And we uh, cover a new case every day, Monday through Friday. For True Crime Chronicles, I'm Will Johnson, along with Reed Redman. We'll be back next week with a new case and a new story. 